So this weekend, obviously Memorial Weekend, a lot of y'all have expectations. You're already thinking through what you're going to enjoy, like the burgers, the steaks, you know, a tip, typical American celebration. Um, and maybe you're, you, this morning you were uh, expecting good weather because usually around this time of the year there is there's sunny weather and you woke up and it's like, my gosh, there is, there is rain this morning. What the heck? Typical Seattle, right? But in life, each and every day of our lives, we are expecting either something or someone. So you're either expecting a child. My wife and I were expecting a child due July 24th. Praise the Lord for that. God is good. Um, we are, you're, you're either expecting a new job. You're expecting an, uh, an Amazon order that you placed in. Your wives, you're expecting your husband to get the grocery list correctly. And somehow, even though you have the picture of the exact item, we managed to mess up the grocery list and bring home a tomato instead of a potato. And, you know, please pray for us. But when it comes to expectations, if those expectations are not met, we are frustrated, we are disappointed, we're let down. There was a trend that was going around for a while where it was, they, they were saying Instagram versus reality or social media versus reality, where um, a content creator might create something uh, from this certain location that they went to and it looks beautiful, very relaxed, and you're like, I got to go to that spot. That's where I'm going this year for vacation. And you go, and it's mid. It's not exactly what you were hoping for. There's a restaurant that a content creator put, and it's like, yo, this place, the burgers are banging. Like, they're straight up fire. And you're like, I got to go try that out. You go, you try the burgers. Ah, don't believe the hype. You're let down. You expect it to be wowed, but you're frustrated, you're let down, you're disappointed. And there is this tension between your expectation and your experience. And I believe we also go through the same, and we face the same tension in our faith between our expectation and our experience. What we're expecting from God and what we're actually experiencing in that moment. Maybe you're um, expecting for God to heal your marriage. You're fighting for your marriage, but there is no change. You're expecting a financial provision. You're believing and praying, but you're still struggling to meet your daily needs. You're praying and believing for physical healing or maybe for yourself or for a loved one, but there is still no change. Maybe it's something you've been praying for years, not just a week, Maybe five years, ten years, and there is still no change. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Caleb um, was, shared with us how his mom for a long time had struggles uh, with, with her mental health. And she was always praying, God, like, deliver me from this. God, heal me from this. But there was no change. What, how do we handle that tension between what we're believing for God to do and what we're actually experiencing in that moment? You end up finding yourself praying prayers like, Lord, I've been faithful to you. I've given, I've attended church, I've read the, the Bible from front to back, and yet the season that I'm in has not changed. Lord, if I'm your child, how am I still going through this traumatic, terrible, lonely experience? Why hasn't my situation changed yet? And you find yourself getting depressed discouraged, filled with hopelessness, anger. You start distrusting, uh, distrusting God. You become bitter. You even become envious because maybe someone else receives the blessing that you've been praying for and you've received this temptation of even walking away from God. Pain will do that to you. Maybe some of us are scared to accuse God and we just ask him, God, what's going on? Why is this happening? A couple years back when I was a teenager, uh, my father, my, not my father, my grandfather suffered a stroke. And he was my hero. He was someone I looked up to. And I remember praying and believing, God, you're going to heal him. You're going to heal him. We're believing for healing in Jesus' mighty name. And one morning, I heard a scream of agony, a, a scream like I had never heard before. And it was my mom who had just received the news that her father had passed away. And I remember being so angry and disappointed with God. I said, God, I don't think I can trust you anymore. You didn't even 
heal my grandfather. You know how much I needed him in this season. So how do we handle the tension between what we expect from God, we believe for God, and what we're actually experiencing? There's a man in the Bible who had to deal with the same tension. His name was John the Baptist. We'll be reading about him today in Luke chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there to Luke chapter 7, verse 18. And a little back story about John the Baptist. He was a significant figure in the Bible. He was known to be the, the, the person who prepared the way for Jesus. He was a prophet. He was a preacher. Thousands and thousands of people came to hear him preach He baptized so many people. Um, He was highly sought after. He was Jesus' cousin. Can you imagine saying that your cousin takes away the sins of the world? You would probably say your cousin adds a lot of sin to this world, right? And in this chapter, John the Baptist is in prison because he has been, he publicly called out Herod for marrying his sister. And so John is locked up in prison. It's been about a year, and he... Here's this news that's going around of the things that Jesus is doing. A couple verses before, Jesus had raised someone from the dead and and healed someone from a deadly disease. And now John receives this news, and this is where we're at in verse 18. And this is what it says. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In other words, they were asking, Are you the Messiah, or should we look for somebody else? You see, John's expectation of the Messiah was pretty much just like any other Jew in that moment. They were expecting a political Messiah. The Jews had been, they were under the Roman rule, and a lot of them had even walked away from faith and they were hoping and expecting a political savior. This is the year of elections and so some of y'all or most of y'all are looking towards somebody as your political hero. Oh, this person is, is going to meet my needs. They're going to make sure we take care of the, the national debt that we have. Oh, this person is, 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 going, to, is going to take care of the issues. This is my political hero. And so this is the kind of tension that's going on at the time. They're expecting a political Messiah, but they receive something else. The Messiah was supposed to establish an everlasting kingdom. He was supposed to proclaim liberty for the, for the captives and open prison doors for those who were bound. I'm sure John is in prison and is wondering, why haven't you overthrown Rome yet? Why aren't you bringing judgment upon the Jews who have walked away from you? You're here talking about you've, you've come to captivate those and set free those who are bound. I'm in jail. Why am I still in prison? Basically, he's asking Jesus, why don't you do more? Haven't you, have you ever asked Jesus that question? Why aren't you doing more? Before John was arrested, he was preaching the gospel. He baptized crowds. He was highly sought after. In fact, when he saw Jesus, the first words that came out of his mouth were, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen. Months go by, he's arrested, and now he's asking, are you the one or should we look for someone else? Maybe you've experience the same thing. In one season, you're declaring the goodness of God. You're declaring that he's faithful, that he's a healer. And all of a sudden, your season changes and you're starting to question, is he really able to heal? Is God really able to take care of this situation? Is he God of the impossible? Because right now it seems like it's pretty impossible for him to get me out of this situation. We ask questions like, Jesus, are you the one that I should keep pursuing or should I look for another savior? Should I look for another solution to help me get out of this situation? Should I look for something else to help me cope with my problem? Are you the Messiah or should I look for something else? And how did Jesus respond? In verse 21, this is what, Jesus, this, this is what it says. It says, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, 
Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Jesus' response to John was not yes or no. That's one of my pet peeves. If I ask someone a yes or no question and they, they give me an essay, I'm like, bro, it's not that deep. Just give me a yes or no. I didn't ask for an essay. And Jesus does not give John a yes or no answer. In fact, Jesus does not address what John observes God is not doing. Jesus is trying to show John what God is doing. Yes, others are experiencing miracles and you're still in prison, but trust me that I am still working. Yes, you're locked up, but I want you to see that there is something greater happening behind the scenes. What area in your life might God be working on that you've overlooked due to focusing on other desires? Yes, you're still single, but maybe God is working on your heart. Yes, you didn't get that raise you've been expecting and money is still tight, but maybe God is trying to teach you how to be a faithful steward with the little that you have. Yes, you don't like that job that you're at, but maybe God has you there so he can soften your heart to love the people around you. Yes, you're stuck in that place, but maybe God has you there because he wants to heal you. That's the place where he can heal your hurts. That's the place he can transform your character. That's the place where he can perfect your prayer, your prayer life. What area of your life might God be working on that you've overlooked due to focusing on other desires? Jesus goes ahead to say in verse 23, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Jesus is telling John and he's encouraging John to persevere. Don't give up. Keep holding on. Jesus assures John that there is a blessing for those who remain steadfast in their faith. This blessing is for anyone who can look beyond their own limited understanding of what God should do, choosing instead to place their faith in Jesus. So I want to encourage you, don't fall away, don't fall back, don't distance yourself from God just because things aren't going the way you want, but rather push towards Jesus, pursue him. One of the things we tend to do as human beings, if people don't meet our expectations, if they let us down, we cut them out of our life, we block them, we distance ourselves from them, and we can actually end up doing the same thing to God. We're frustrated, we're upset, and then we distance ourselves from God. Not knowing that the very person you're distancing yourself from can actually help you process that anger. The very person you're distancing yourself from can actually give you healing and as you process that frustration. So I want to encourage you, don't distance yourself from God, but stay close to him. Stay close to him. Jesus was not upset with John's question. Jesus is not offended by your doubt. He's not offended by your questions. He's not offended about your frustrations. In fact, Jesus later says that, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. I, I'm sure that there were people around who had seen John declare, this is the Messiah, this is the Messiah. And now he's saying, are you the one? And I'm sure they were questioning, wait a minute, you were the one who was hyping him up just a second ago. And now you're questioning him? But Jesus does not talk down on John. He speaks well of John. I'm so thankful that, I, that we serve a king, we serve a Messiah who does not speak down on us. He does not discourage us. But when we have our doubts and we come to him, he speaks well of us. He encourages us. He's not disgusted by you, but he loves you. He's proud of you. I'm so thankful that that's the kind of God we serve, that he's not petty. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm a petty individual. God is working on me. I mean, just pray for your boy. Like, if someone, you know, upsets me, I'm the kind of person, like, cut you out. So I'm, I'm not perfect. God is working on me and, you know, pray for your boy. But I'm thankful that we serve a God who is not petty. But he's gracious. He's loving. He draws us close to him. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. John actually never got out of prison. He died in prison. He was beheaded 
in prison. But I'm sure that the message Jesus sent him encouraged him. Here's a question. What if God's will for your life is that you remain in that place? What if God's will for your life is that you remain in that situation? What if God calls you to stay at that job? What if God calls you to, 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 to stay in that neighborhood? What if God does not physically heal you? What if your financial situation does not change? Will you still trust him? Will you submit to him? Or will you throw a tantrum? I have a three-year-old, and so we're trying to teach her, you know, it's okay to be upset, but don't be throwing your toys all around the house. We don't do that. Will you trust him? Will you submit to him? Will you still serve him? So many of us Christians have our own will. We build our own kingdom, forgetting that God has a plan. He has a, a will, and we're called to submit to his will. Submit to his plan. In fact, Jesus is the greatest example of this. Before he was arrested and crucified, he's praying in the garden. He says, Father, please take this cup away from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Will your prayers be, God, this isn't looking like the way I wanted or like I thought, but I trust you, I bless you, I will still serve you, I will still worship you. Not my will, but yours be done. Would you get the glory through it all? That's the level of maturity that God is calling us to. Luke uh, chapter 7, verse 28, we go further in 28, where Jesus says, I tell you among those born... Of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. First time I read that, it was really confusing. Because John the Baptist is a great man. He's known as one of, Jesus says he's the greatest prophet. But yet Jesus says that the least in the kingdom is greater than John. What does that even mean? It means that you and I are in a, a blessed state compared to John. It's in terms of blessedness. So John signified an end of an era. These were people who lived before the cross. So what was, what was people's relationship like that time before the cross? They sacrificed animals to repent for their sin. The presence of God was distant. The spirit of God was only for specific people. Not, any, not everyone would receive the presence of God, the, the spirit of God of the living God. So these people were, they didn't have that, 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 that intimate relationship with God. Then Jesus comes to the earth. He dies on the cross. He's buried and resurrected. And guess what happens? He turns that around. God is no longer distant, but we can have an intimate relationship with God. Emmanuel, God with us. The spirit of God is for anyone who believes. We don't have to sacrifice animals but we can just receive the mercy and grace of God because Jesus paid the debt. We're in a better state than John. You and I, brothers and sisters, are experiencing things that people in the Old Testament only hoped for, they believed for, they were praying for. And you and I get to experience the grace, the mercy, the love of God in this time. What a time to be alive. What a time to be alive. The Bible says, even the angels desire to look into those things that have been brought to pass through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the angels envy you. Even the angels. Can you imagine that? Most of us are like, yo, it would be super cool to be an angel. Like, the angels are envying you because you get to experience the grace, the love of God, unlike anyone else before the cross of Jesus Christ. In 2009, there was uh, an event that occurred here in America that captured the attention of the entire world. It was a historic moment. Regardless of your political affiliation, you know, Democrat, Republican, I don't really care. We can all agree that this was something that, changed, that made a huge worldwide statement. And that was the year when America voted in the first African-American president. That was... Worldwide, a very big thing. I remember as a kid 
in Uganda watching the news. And those who didn't have a television were listening to the radio. Whoa, this is a big moment. This is, this is, this is history in the making. We get to see it. And one of the stories that blew up during that time was the story of Virginia McLaurin. She was born in March, she was born on March 12th, 1909 in South Carolina. She experienced the harsh realities of a racial segregation and the Jim Crow laws throughout her early years and much of her adult life. In 2009, she was 106 years old when the first African-American president was voted in. And a couple months later, she was invited to the White House. She got to experience something that her ancestors and parents only hoped for. People like Dr. King dreamed about. And you and I, and her included, got to experience something that people in the past only believed and hoped and prayed that someday would happen. But even greater than that is something that happened 2,000 years ago. The cross, the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is more than just a historic event. It's, it makes an eternal difference. That people who lived in the Old Testament envied about, they hoped to get. And you and I get to experience that today. What a time to be alive. We are in the kingdom of God. You're in the kingdom of God. You can be thankful for the time that you live in, that you get to experience the grace of God. Anyone can thank God for a phone. Anyone can thank God for a house. Anyone can thank God for an iPad. But it takes another level of maturity to thank God for the intangible. God, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your spirit that dwells in, within me. I thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. God, I thank you that your plans for me are to give me hope and a future. God, I thank you that you are with me and I'm not alone. It takes another level of maturity. We are in the kingdom. That's something to be grateful for. Yes, you might be going through hell right now, but you can be thankful for the cross of Jesus Christ. You might be struggling to pay your bills. I know it's difficult, but you can be thankful for the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. You can be thankful for the relationship that you have with your Savior. You might be struggling with your health, but you have something to be thankful and grateful for, and that's the grace of Jesus Christ. Even if it gets worse, you can still have joy because of the because of the cross, because of the relationship we have with God. The greatest miracle, there's always this debate, what's the greatest miracle? Jesus walking on water. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. The greatest miracle is not even Jesus opening the eyes of the blind. The greatest miracle is the forgiveness of sins. Because no one could do that but our God. That's the greatest miracle. You might not experience another miracle in your life, but you can be thankful for that miracle, that your sins are forgiven. I experienced that this week. I woke up and I was just like, oh man, it feels so good to be forgiven. It feels so good to know that God loves me. It feels so good to know that I can walk in a close relationship with God. What a time to be alive. You and I get to experience something that people in the Old Testament only hoped they could experience. And we get to experience that today. So whatever you're going through, I don't know the pain, I don't know the struggle, but ask yourself, God, what are you working on? Whatever you're going through, you can still be thankful for the cross of Jesus Christ. And I want to pray for you today that God would give you strength to endure whatever it is you're going through. That God would give you his joy in the midst of your battle. That God would open your eyes to see what he's doing and not focus on what he's not doing. That God would give you perseverance. That God would develop what he, he wants to do in your life. That God would give you his heart. That God would help you to become more of the person that he's creating and calling you to be. Can we stand up? Never lose the wonder of the cross. That's something we can be thankful for today. You can be thankful for the love of God. You can be thankful for the grace of God. Life is full of, of trials. And, and, and hear me out, hear me out. I'm not saying that we should not believe for great things from God. That's not 
the takeaway of this message. Please keep praying, keep, keep believing. But what I'm challenging us is what if the answer is no? Will you still trust God? What if the answer is no? Will you still pursue Jesus? Maybe you're here and you've been struggling. You feel, you feel down. And, and I, want to, I want to encourage you that don't process your thoughts or your, your disbeliefs or your anger or your frustrations by yourself. Dig deeper. Pursue Jesus. Tell God of your frustrations. He wants to walk through that hurt with you. He wants to walk through that pain with you. And you're going to come through the other side victorious. Be more like the person that Jesus has created you to be. So this morning, you might not have anything to be thankful for, but you can be thankful for the cross of Jesus Christ. You can be thankful for the love of Jesus Christ. You can be thankful for the, for the mercies that are new. Come on, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. God, we thank you that you are an intentional God. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now who may be going through a trial, who may be going through a storm and they're frustrated. God, they feel let down, they feel disappointed. Lord, I pray that in this season that you would give them strength to endure. Help them to, 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 be, to stand firm on your promises, to stand firm that God, even though this season might not change, God, you are consistently there. God, I pray that, that we, would, we, we would remember your word that says that you would never leave us nor forsake us. But that you also said that you wouldn't leave us alone as orphans, but you would send your spirit. And Lord, I pray that you give us the strength to walk with, 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 with boldness that our God is on our side. My season might not change, but, my, but God's love remains. God is still constant. Father, and I pray that, that you continue to remove the things that you, rem that you want to take out of our lives. Continue to purify us. Continue to make us more like Jesus. Continue to enable us to grow into the men and women that you're calling us to be. And Father, I pray that in the, in the midst of the trials and the storms, we would turn our eyes to the cross. We would turn our eyes to Jesus and say, we're thankful for the grace of Jesus Christ. We're thankful for the cross. We're thankful that we are in the kingdom, that we're no longer slaves to sin, but we're children of the most high God. Our situation might not change, but we're in the kingdom. We're not perfect, but we're in the kingdom. We're, we're still trying to figure life out, but we're in the kingdom. God, I thank you that you are working in us. And Lord, I pray that in this season that we would continue to see you be God in everything that we go through. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone says. Everyone says. Come on, give God a mighty shout of praise.